Uh, the Finance Committee meeting is adjourning at uh, 9, I have 9.30 um, on April. I think it's called to order. It's called to order. Uh, call to order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. I'm yes, we could adjourn. It's day, right. it's day three. <laughs> Um, April 19th, uh, all members are present, that being Alderwoman Finlayson to my right and Alderwoman O'Neill to my left. At this point, I'll accept um, a motion to approve today's agenda. Uh, move approval of the agenda as written. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 So we are um, in day three of our finance committee review of the mayor's budget, and we have two departments that are presenting. We'll have the two departments, um, and there will be a break in between. Um, and uh, one caveat from feedback is please introduce um, whoever's at the table, whoever's speaking, introduce your name um, by, by name. Um, ad, not really address, title, et cetera. And please um, feel free to invite, I mean, to invite or tell us who else is here, just so the public is aware of, of, of everybody participating. Because I know you've all taken time out of your day, so just they should have the recognition. So with that, um, we'll start with planning and zoning. These are your sheets. Oh, thank you. Good morning, yeah. Alderman Woman. Uh, is this volume okay? Yes. Great. Uh, for the record, uh, Thomas Smith, I'm the acting director of planning and zoning. Uh, to my right is uh, Maria Brown, assistant to the director. Uh, we have with us this evening, this morning, excuse me, Sam on the page as well. Uh, the, we, we operate as a team in planning and zoning, as you all know, and just about the entire team of division section chiefs are here. Um, Steve Rice, Eric Lashinsky, uh, John Manessa, and uh, Brian Adams, our city arborist, is here as well. Uh, Teresa Wellman is out with COVID, so she is not here this morning. Um, but any detailed questions that we can't handle that we need Teresa for, we can certainly follow up with you all on those. Yeah, we'll try to get our questions in verbally, and if not, we'll email, email them to you. So we'll just see how it goes. Sounds great. Yep. All right. All right. So thank you for the time this morning. Um, planning and zoning FY 2024. Um, this is literally uh, my first time at the dance, so, so to speak. After more than 30 years at the city, it's not my first time around the block, but it's the first time here. So. Um, the first uh, slide we have this morning is our, uh, our staffing chart that shows um, all of the positions within the department. There are currently 34 positions in planning and zoning, and we are requesting two additional positions um, with our enhancements, and I'll get into those later. It's, again, as you all know, um, planning and zoning is perhaps one of the most frontline agencies in the city of Annapolis. We are also one of the agencies that probably delivers the most diverse amount of services. Um, staff ranging anywhere from economic developers to preservationists to electricians to plumbers to affordable housing experts to arborists to architects to long-range planners. We do quite a lot in planning and zoning. So this chart is a reflection of who those people are. The next chart just really is a simple flow chart that really delineates how the department is essentially two arms. Uh, we have a permit and inspections arm where we have the building and trade permits and property maintenance. And then we have the planning side, uh, which has development review and long range planning, housing and economic development and historic preservation. So that's how the department is broken down into sections. Department highlights for, for 2023 this past year, as you can see, and this has been a very busy year for planning and zoning. Um, implementation of the uh, InterGov permitting system got uh, underway in January, and not without uh, a few bumps along the way, and uh, without the help from our wonderful people at MIT, we're, we're working things through. Um, a couple of development projects I thought I would highlight. Uh, the Village of Providence Point was approved earlier in the year after literally 12 years of, re of review. Uh, the CRAD, the Chesapeake Regional Accessible Boating Center, is, is now open. Um, that's uh, uh, 
It was a very unique facility, probably unlike almost any in the United States, and we have it right here in the city of Annapolis, and we're very proud of that project. Um, completed. Uh, we issued 794 uh, permits and with a construction value of just over $87 million. Um, I think what that tells you is that Annapolis is a very popular place to live. We hope so. also hope it's a popular place to work and play. Um, we've been, uh, our Chief of Comprehensive Planning has been very busy with Annapolis Ahead 2024. Uh, 2040, excuse me, that's our comprehensive plan, uh, which we hope to have uh, approved uh, earlier this summer. Um, I'd say majority of the department's been very busy working on the city dock redevelopment plans and, and moving those forward, along with water access development plan. Uh, we hired uh, a low um, income housing specialist uh, who's been a great asset to the department this past year. Um, We've been having uh, many, many meetings, I think as many as 17 for the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, the development of Harbor House at Eastport Terrace. We just held uh, a Zoom meeting last night and an in-person meeting Monday night at the Eastport Church. Uh, both were well, well attended and, and great feedback. And I have to say that the consultant team on that project is just outstanding um, as far as professionals and their level of expertise. Um, the Parklet program continues. We're gonna continue that, that successful full program. Um, the establish the MPDU uh, Settlement Expense Assistance Program. Teresa Wellman's been very busy with that new program. And for what I understand from Teresa, we just had our first settlement at Parkside that she assisted with. So that's off to a great start with that program. For our goals for 2024, um, we're looking for continue some additional training uh, as we adjust InterGov to work with both staff and the customer interface. Um, so we'll all be, be busy in continuing our um, relationship uh, with MIT, which is sometimes hourly, uh, but it's, it's, it's coming along. Um, certainly the adoption of Annapolis Head 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Um, we want to complete the land use and infrastructure evaluation study that follows that. Um, that's really looking at the, the economics of land, each land use and its value um, and what it brings to the city. Um, can I certainly want to continue improving the, uh, the quality of affordable housing, um, complete the sales and availability of moderate price dwelling units at the Parkside Preserve Project, which is well under construction at this point. Um, continue to ensure that our capital improvements program is consistent with our, our land use and comprehensive plans. Uh, ensuring quality of design and development review, which is never an easy task, um, but we receive a lot of support in that regard from our planning commissions and boards. Um, increasing urban tree canopy, uh, we're always working on that goal, but it seems like Mother Nature has been difficult the last few years, um, and certainly our city arborist, Brian Adams, has been quite busy with that, um, but we're still working to uh, maintain and improve our tree canopy goals in the city. Um, Mr. Rice and, and his staff are very busy um, recruiting businesses and maintaining businesses to the city of Annapolis. Um, so kudos to he and his staff have been quite busy this past year. And just a continuation of that, if you will. Some long range goals we have for our future years. Uh, as we have the adoption of Annapolis Ahead 2040, uh, hopefully, we can follow that with a review and rewrite, actually, of the entire, entire excuse me, uh, zoning code. Um, we've been working on an update and rewrite of Title 15 for harbors and waterways plan. Uh, we'd like to move that uh, forward. Uh, Mr. Scott was very busy uh, working on that prior to his illness. Um, continue working on the increasing the stock of affordable housing. We've had a number of pieces of legislation, uh, as you know. Uh, we want to continue moving those forward and see how we can implement some of that. Um, using innovative techniques and public outreach for obtaining citizen participation. This one is of a very particular interest to me and, and close to my heart because, frankly, over the many years, public participation has made every project better in the city of Annapolis. Um, and so we want to make sure everybody 
uh, has an opportunity to participate in, in all projects, be they development review, or long range planning, whatever they happen to be. Um, I guess one of the best examples I can cite for you is a project like Acton's Landing. It, the degree of public participation in that project, the amount of changes uh, that garnered us a national award. I think if you look at what happened on Inner West Street in the last 25 years with a number of projects and the public participating not only in, in setting up the Inner West Street action plan and supporting the changes in the zoning to supporting the development has gone from a place that maybe was less desirable land uses to a bit of an it place, frankly. Um, we want to continue to uh, increase opportunities uh, for planting and green spaces uh, throughout the city. Some of our performance measures for this past year, some of the things that were successful and a couple things that were not as successful. Um, from a current planning perspective, uh, we're continuing to, to train the staff and their, and their continuing education credits. Um, and that's been, been going quite well, just sort of keeping up with all the changes that goes on, um, not only in the city, but in, in planning in general. Uh, the percentage of project applications that are reviewed for completeness in what we call our three-day rule, um, that's really important to us that when an application comes in, it has action on it as it reviewed for completeness within three days. Um, we work hard to achieve that goal and let the applicant know if something's missing, what they, what they need to add to it um, so that they can continue on in the process in, in a timely fashion. Um, licensing and permits uh, is very, very similar. Um, prompt permit review, processing just over 99% in the last quarter. Um, my hat's off to John Manassa and his staff for, for that. And economic development. Um, the number of businesses that were assisted average about 32 a month. Um, total provided assistance, uh, businesses and partners was 386. So you can see that Mr. Rice and his staff are quite busy as, as well. Um, a couple items that were perhaps least successful, um, we were really hoping to, to assist the public with creating more forms and guidelines and putting those on our website. Um, such as new programs that were implemented like ADUs, and we have some of that, um, but it could all be updated, especially as we move to a new intergov process and how that works. Um, I simply have no administrative staff to make that happen, um, hence one of the enhancements I'm asking for in my budget. Um, increasing the tree canopy, which again, Mother Nature has not been kind to us lately. Um, we lost quite a bit of forest conservation area from the tornado. Um, and so having recovery for that is going to take some time. Um, but with that, I will tell you that Mr. Adams uh, was working on what's called Replant Annapolis. And last year, um, they programmed and planted uh, 102 trees in four communities. So we can hope to continue that program and enjoy success from that program. and turn that into an asset in the future, not, not on our, 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 our list of least successful, but perhaps most successful. Uh, the page that we're all waiting for, enhancements. Um, we're asking for uh, three enhancements this year, an office associate. Um, currently, this is a, um, a part-time contractual position, and we would like to make that into a full-time uh, city position. I will tell you when Jane Holshue re retired probably more than 10 years ago, that uh, position was taken from the department and has never been given back. Um, not only was Jane the assistant to the planning director, but she provided to current planning and comprehensive planning all the administrative services that you can think of, and we have been without since, and it has shown, and we would really like to have that position back. So take our contractual part-time to a full-time position, and we have a lot of work for that person to do, should you agree to that. I'm also asking for a position for a new planner in current planning in particular. And some of my thoughts on that um, is during the Moyer administration, I can't remember how many years I'm going back, uh, the department was given an additional planner position. Uh, within six months, when the administration changed um, and the budget was not where 
I don't know what the word was for it at the time, the position was taken from us and never given back. And in the 30 years that I have been here, we have had three planners. Um, I would say the workload has probably increased tenfold. The litigious nature of that work has increased probably a hundredfold. When the Department of Neighborhoods and Environmental Programs merged with planning and zoning, uh, there were positions that were eliminated, but functions were not. And current planning absorbed those functions. Um, and my hat's off to the late Kevin Scott for taking a lot of that work on himself and his works. Um, myself and also the city arborist Brian Adams took a lot of that load. Um, but we are so far under, underwater that we are just not functioning adequately. I'm sure you're getting the complaints. Uh, so I would like to have an additional planner in, in, that, in that role to take over those responsibilities. Tom, yes, I just um, want to interject and say that I know this is really hard that you, your department has suffered a loss. I can see it on your faces and I just want you to know that we are all thinking of Kevin and know that this is very hard for you so thank you very much yeah yes he was not only my right hand but my left hand also writ literally um, so for those reasons that I'm happy to keep going and articulate further why we're looking for an additional planner position um, you know, this is the capital of the state of Maryland and we want to ensure it is represented as the capital with the quality that we provide to its citizens um, particularly in development review applications. Uh, this is uh, simply a slide that shows our overall uh, budget summary. Um, I think these probably important items of note here, if you look at the FY23 adjusted budget, was just over $5 million. And in our proposed FY24, we're looking at 5.1. Uh, I think a fairly minor uh, adjustment, all things being considered. From our funding, um, if you look at these items, um, you know, our reforestation is, is money we, 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 we collect from fee and lieu and how that is spent. Again, Mr. Adams is very busy with that. Community legacy, um, there are no projects from what I understand, um, which is why there's a zero at, at the end there. Um, however, as I'm assured for Ms. Wellman, if something comes up, we can apply. Um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, this is a, a standard every year. This is housing rehabilitation programs. This also supports uh, homes at the Glen settlement expenses and also supports our new MPDU settlement expense program. Community development block grant, I think it's fairly consistent over, over the years. Um, this is entitlement money that we get from, from HUD um, and is delivered to low and moderate income housing and special projects. Uh, we all know that uh, Ms. Wellman is, is quite successful in that those endeavors, excuse me. This chart here I thought was important to delineate. This is uh, an overall city uh, FY 2024 budget. And I think what's important to note, uh, at least from my perspective and I think of the staff, is the small percentage of the overall budget that is planning and zoning from one of the most frontline agencies that delivers probably the broadest range of diverse services to the public and we are just 5% of that overall budget compared to other agencies. And I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Colleagues, Alderman Ben Lyson. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Smith, for uh, highlighting so much of what your department does. Thank you. Um, and I hope folks are listening and paying attention because we don't even know all the things that entail the planning and zoning department. So your presentation uh, clarifies a lot. Um, first of all, I'll speak on 2008-2009 when we went through a very severe budget crunch and we lost positions, 33 if I recall correctly. And part of those cuts were all of the admin positions in all the departments, if I remember correctly. And they were never restored. 
And today we hear people complaining, I call planning and zoning, I call public works and nobody answers. Well, no, because there's nobody there to answer. Our professionals are out doing what they do. And that's not a good thing. And, and I would really like to see us restoring those positions so that our uh, service to the public is um, more of a positive experience. And this isn't anything reflecting on your department. I'm speaking in general terms. Um, that we should think about customer service, and maybe I should be directing this to Mr. Malinov. Um, that's part of customer service. When folks call to get answers for whatever the subject is, it's nice to have either somebody to answer or, or some direction. We all hate those electronic things. Say press one if you want this person. But there has to be some better way to make the connection. So thank you for highlighting it. Um, the enhancements that you listed, are they in the mayor's budget? From what I understand, yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, Ms. Dickinson, Dickinson is saying yes. Uh, so good. Um, congratulations on Providence Point. 12 years in the making. Finally got it across the finish line. And I contend that it's a good project because of uh, the time and effort that was spent making it right from all sides. Yes, ma'am. So let's hope now that it will really <laughs> move forward. Um, so anyway, I won't speak any more to that. Inspectors. Do you have adequate inspectors? And, and I know in a perfect world, no, no one ever has enough inspectors. But um, you're not asking for additional inspectors. And I know I call about rentals or property issues and always needing inspectors to come out and do something. Right. So do we have adequate inspectors? If you don't mind, I'm going to ask Chief Manassan, because that is, that is his forte. And, um, mm -hmm. He's the supervisor of the inspectors. Good morning, thank you for asking. We have a current opening we're in the process of filling for a property maintenance inspector. The first round of um, the advertisement went out and we received an applicant that was qualified and we pursued that individual, but he ended up declining. So we re-advertised um, just recently, about two weeks ago, and we have um, some good prospects in this group. So hopefully we'll be able to fill that position. Uh, we also have a, an opening in a building inspector position that we will, I think, be able to fill um, probably in the next couple months. It's a very advanced position. It uh, takes a lot of certifications to um, fill that position. And I think we're in the process of, of seeing one of the employees gaining certification to fill that one, and that'll open up another building inspector position that's less demanding and probably a lot easier to fill. We weren't able to fill that one by advertising it externally. Um, just didn't get the applicants. Like the, the county's in the same position. They've got sort of just an open until filled combination inspector position. So it's, it's just one of those things that's very demanding to, to try to fill that position. But internally, we may have somebody that's able to do it. And I think we're going to be in good shape for right now. I. I applaud your approach of trying to train your own you know if you have someone who has the potential to get the necessary training to be able to do it um, are we competitive in our uh, salaries and benefits I personally haven't searched um, like whether we are competitive or not I, I feel like we are um, I think the the openings we, we have, uh, the, the particular property maintenance inspector, I think is a, is a competitive um, rate for an inspector. Okay, just needing to keep that in mind, and especially as we're getting ready to do the common class study. Mr. Did I say what you were gonna say? <laughs> okay, um, great. Um, let's see, CDBG grants. Uh, looking at the chart, I, is it a negative number because those outside funds coming in? I'm on page 11, I think. 
Um, no, it's on page 12. I'm sorry. So you're looking at yours? I'm looking at um, the budgeted amount for 23, the adjusted amount, and the projected are all negative numbers. Is that because we don't know how much we're getting for CDBG? Jody's mic. Can you turn your mic on, please? Totally forgot. Jody Dickinson, finance director. The CDBG amounts, you're looking at the bottom line, which is the difference between the revenue and the expenses. When you see a negative there in one of these smaller funds, you're, it means that we're trying to spend down some of the fund balance that they have accumulated in addition to the money they anticipate getting in the current year. So that's why the bottom would be negative. You're, you've already got the, the revenues from the previous year. You're going to spend them this year, plus you're going to spend your new money. And in the CDBG programs, she has some left from the current year that she's going to carry over. Okay, I was also looking at the revenue for 23 projected, which is half of um, the adjusted for 23. Hmm. So I, I'm just trying to account for why that would be. Do we expect to get? We, get the, we recognize the revenue in the current year as we are spending the money. So if we're not spending it, we're not going to pull in the revenue. So that's going to be timed with the... Okay, so those expense. numbers would, will change. Yes, yes. Um, and, and we'll see. It's just the, the timing of the receipt of the revenue, not necessarily that we're not going to get it. It's the timing of the receipt of it. Okay, thank you. Um, MPDUs. And I'll, I'll speak to the specific project. You know where I'm going with this probably, Rocky Gorge. Mm -hmm. um, they were advertising on their beautiful website um, four or five different models. The cheapest, I assumed, were the MPDU units, which it, on the website says they're all sold. And in speaking to Ms. Wellman, she hadn't even spoken to them to work out what the cost would be. And, and first of all, I don't think people understand that we set the price for those MPDU. Correct. Not the developer. Correct. Uh, and so the developer, so my question is, how do we communicate as soon as the plan is approved? Does the information go to the developer or are they just ignoring it? Or do we not make it clear that we set the MPDU rate and they have to follow it? So from what I understand of the program, when a development project is approved, there are developer agreements that are initiated through Mrs. Wellman um, for the project. But then as the permits come in, the building permits themselves, then she begins to work on where are they, uh, when will they be coming available, what are the price points, who's applicants on the list that qualify for those units and then she I guess takes from the top and starts working with those applicants for as those units come online but yes we set the price so it they are notified but not until the permit they start to get there they should actual. frankly have been communicating with they the developer excuse me all along yes uh, this is a, a new developer to Annapolis, let me put it that way. Uh, those with more experience would have been communicating quite regularly with the department and Ms. Wellman. Well, he surrounded himself with Annapolis folks, so mm, should know. Um, that brings up another issue about um, the life expectancy of approvals. I've heard from the uh, planning director, Mr. Pline, at one point, when who said um, it shouldn't last forever. You know, the approval that was given for Rocky Gorge was given in 2006, and the developer was able to pick up that plan and move forward with it. Um, should we be? putting a timeline or a time limit on the plans. And maybe I'm getting out of, of the scope of the Finance Committee for a moment here. Um, because a lot of things have changed in the community since those original plans were approved in 2006, the plan development in 2006. Correct. 
Uh, and so none of those changes over the last 15 years are considered in the new, in the plan. So how do we address this, I guess, is my question to you. So I think the, the scenario you present is an extremely unique scenario. So there are timelines for when a subdivision or plan development or special exception is, or any of those site design is approved. And it's usually a year. If you don't vest the project or garner your permits, you can ask for an extension. You can get another year extension. But after that, you have to start over in the process. And most applicants are able to get their projects through permit review and started and shovels in the ground within that time frame. Um, we, we have extensions from time to time on special exceptions that usually vest with the use and occupancy permit rather than the start of construction. Um, fairly standard. But in this case, not only do we have tolling from the state and the city, unique because of the economy that you mentioned earlier, and then we have COVID extensions on top of that. Uh, very unique scenario, germane, really to just this particular project. I think perhaps Parkside may have enjoyed from the COVID extensions. But Rocky Gorge slash Athens is really one of the projects that, I hate to use the word enjoyed, but for lack of a better term, kept their approvals alive because of tolling and COVID extensions. Um, that is not the norm, normally does not happen. Okay, so. and, and I think the tolling took place in 14, if I'm not mistaken. Well, there was quite a lengthy time of tolling, both from the state of Maryland and then followed by the city of Annapolis. But your point is well taken, older woman, yes, as far as uh, projects change. I do believe we, we did uh, ask for a new stormwater management, and it was re-reviewed and brought up to current city standards. Um, but I know there are other issues that could be, if we were looking at this project today, perhaps been done differently, yes. Well, I can look forward to have, continuing this discussion about yes, what we need to be doing. Uh, tree canopy. The uh, tornado went through part of Aris Allen Boulevard. So that's no longer a forest. What do we do? How do we do it? How do we classify it? And is it the private owners who invite you in? Well, let me ask you the question. How do we deal with that? So it is a, a forest conservation area uh, that was approved as part of the Rocky Gorge Ayers Allen development. Um, technically, forest conservation easements when given to the city are for the city to maintain. Um, however, the city arborist has gone out and looked at the area and verified what was, was it in the easement area, was it not? It seems to be within the easement area. In working with a project developer, um, we have the ability to, if we feel there is an overall change in character, and we can ask for new uh, forest conservation plans. Uh, what I've asked for uh, with the building permits is an invasives management plan, uh, because it very quickly will that area be overrun with vines and invasive vegetation. And what we want to do is control that area and keep it from spreading further to the other forest within and around that area. Um, so that's a requirement that we have asked for the developers. Um, with their application to amend the architecture, which they have sent in um, as a minor modification to the plan development, they are also to include this invasive management plan, which we will be reviewing. I've not received it as of yet. Okay. Well, so we are, yes. It sounds like you're, um, it's in a work in progress. I yes, ma'am. Okay, um, page eight, timeline, that's my quick note. Um, the three day, which is good. Is, are we looking to give timelines to other steps in the permitting process? Um, applications, you're saying three days, which I think is terrific. That is one of the, the areas that we can actually contr control, right? And an application comes in and we review it for completeness. Does it have all the items that are, that are necessary to review that application going forward? 
as you know, there are oftentimes items that we, we do not control as part of the review process, whether there are changes, whether it comes back once, twice, three times. Uh, an application may need a traffic study, which then we engage an outside consultant. We can't really control the timeline on that. Some of the reviews are beyond the city of Annapolis. They are state reviews, whether it's DNR or MDE or the Critical Area Commission, uh, Soil Conservation. We are certainly hold great relationships with those agencies, but we don't control mm -hmm. the timeline on those agencies either. Uh, State Highway Administration would be yet another, right? Um, though we certainly coordinate with those. But where we can control them, we are want to make sure that within three days we are responding to an applicant that your application is complete and we're going to move it on to the various agencies or we need X and Y uh, from you so then we can then move it forward. Okay. so. We are looking, though, at, at our timeline on things we can control. We are well aware. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and economic development, Mr. Rice, uh, phenomenal. You go from 32 to 386. That's not a question. That's just an accolade. Incredible. <laughs> so anyway, I think congratulations, everybody. I mean, you guys are doing an awesome job with the very limited uh, staff that you have. Um, I know over the years when Mr. Arison was here, he, he didn't really want to increase his staff because he liked his office space, you know. Um, so, but now it's time for us to do, to give you what you need. Thank you, Alderman. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman Finlayson. and Alderman O'Neill. Um, yes, I just have a couple of questions and in regards to staffing. I'm not and when I look down, it looks like you are missing several staff. Um, but you were clever. Unless I um, was mistaken on titles. Um, and how is that if, I know that we talked about the hiring of one of the inspectors. Um, is that negatively affecting, affecting um, the outcomes and performance on permitting and things like that. Um, can you tell me about the number of staff that, according to this, you're currently missing? Are you specifically referring to inspection staff? Yes. Yes. John, Oops. John left. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe Maria can help. Oh, Sorry. introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Maria Brown. I'm the assistant to the director of planning and zoning. So yes, it does in that when we don't have, and, and, and we particularly feel it in the summertime when people start taking vacations. So when we don't have enough inspectors uh, and people are requesting an inspection and they need it in the next you know couple of days, if we don't have enough inspectors and one goes on vacation, and right now with one vacant position as building inspectors, so we only have two. So one goes on vacation, you're down to one, they have to do all of those inspections while that person is on vacation or out sick or out for whatever reason. So yes, the lack of inspectors does, um, does do damage to our providing good customer service and getting the inspections for the trades when they need them. And you know, trade, trade contractors need their inspections, they have deadlines to meet because things are being built and so they have to have their things inspected. With the property maintenance inspector that we're hiring or that we're trying to hire is one that I believe the council had requested, wanted us to get for the evenings and weekends. Mm -hmm. So as, as um, John said, we are pursuing that, but you can only hire from the people who, uh, mm -hmm. who, you know, who send in a resume and who want the position. But I'm sure that that will help our property maintenance inspectors as well as doing the evenings and weekend shifts. Thank you. Is there like a temporary agency that you can <laughs> pull from as far as inspectors go, especially in summertime, um, you we, know, when we, there are vacations and whatnot? We are. We do have two contractual uh, inspectors. One is an electrical, and one is a plumbing. So when our plumbing, because we only have one electrical inspector and one plumbing inspector, one mechanical inspector. So when our plumbing inspector goes on vacation, this part-time person does come in and cover when he's not there. And that helps because otherwise you wouldn't have plumbing inspections for a week or whatever. 
Same thing with the electrical inspector. He comes in and fills in when our electrical inspector goes out. We don't have a part-time mechanical inspector as a backup, nor do we have part-time building inspectors. Um, I don't know how beneficial that would be or how long it would take to be beneficial because they have to learn our codes before they can actually you know, go out and do those inspections. So I, I don't know how beneficial it would be to try to get a temporary, but we do have people who are, who are contractual, who sign contracts, and who try to be available when we need them, when we're down inspectors. Okay, and does your department have um, sufficient funding for such things like when you need to bring in those contractors? For the, for the contractuals that we have, yes. Okay. Right now we do, yes. I'm pulling an old woman, Finlayson, and asking if you need more money. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's the number one um, complaint that I get from my constituents. Um, I love your department. They love the fact that they're able to you know, get their applications reviewed quickly. But the number one complaint is the inspection process. Um, so I would love to see us really up that um, yes. customer service level. Definitely. And I, I would be willing to support something if you came back and said, this is where we could increase that customer service level. We'll also have to increase space because we have to have space to put them to. So <laughs> right now we're working on the two, the one that is vacant and has been vacant since last year when the inspector retired. So that's been vacant for a long time, and that's the combination inspector that John was talking about. Um, so we're working on that one and the property maintenance inspector that the council approved for us last year. Okay. Can you recognize? Oh. Thank you. Mike Mallon has a question. Mr. Malinoff. Michael Malinoff, city manager. I have a little familiarity with the department. And um, <laughs> What I will say, the space issue also, because I had piped in a little bit on the comp classification study ongoing and addressing the issue earlier, is we also have an ongoing space study. And part of the problems we are having, and Ms. Dickinson is an example of it, is there are positions in the budget, but they're not being funded because we don't have space for them. And so we're trying to resolve that uh, Public Works, I think, is in the final throes of that. They've been interviewing with the different departments, and the hopes are then we can come forward to the council with some ideas on uh, additional space. But it is a problem. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last comment um, is in regards to Brian the Arborist. Um, it's been requested um, by several community associations um, that we kind of do a tree road show, um, coming to talk to community organizations um, really about Annapolis's rules and regulations in regards to trees, removal of trees, planting trees. Um, so I'm throwing that out there because I happen to be sitting right here. <laughs> but I appreciate all that you guys are doing. Thank you. Alderman O'Neill, can I add just briefly to your question? So I know you were directed at more to inspections, um, but because we had some additional monies in the budget, and, and Jody certainly helped us out with this, I was able to um, contract back uh, Ms. Gudinius, who retired last year, uh, three days a week, and she is helping in current planning and development review. So we're, we're taking advantage where we can. I appreciate that. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Alderman O'Neill. Um, sort of to, um, I, I think I have four questions, but to dovetail into what Alderman O'Neill was asking, my understanding, and this question is directed to the city manager, my understanding last year was that uh, when we had, <clears throat> uh, I think it was a work session, our initial work session on the budget, what we kept hearing is enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And I believe in response, we did add a, a part-time zoning compliance officer, um, more of an enforcement person versus an inspector. Uh, did, is that the position that is that we're still looking for? Because I think that's what Alderman O'Neill is, is speaking about, is enforcement. You know, that's the biggest complaint I know that I get from downtown residents. Uh, Michael Malinoff, city manager, I'll let them describe their process, but the, long, the short answer to that is yes. It's 
the origin of that was when uh, Ms. Brown and I were before the body in your work session, December, two years ago. Um, and we discussed the issue of, of the concept of what I call the off hours inspector and being available at various times and flexibility. But as um, Mr. Manassa mentioned, they're having difficulty getting that position filled and that's sort of where they are right now. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. And then in line with that, I know this, this is similar to Alderman uh, Finlayson's request about the survey and the money that was put in the budget for a survey. I know that we put $20,000 in a couple of years ago to, to uh, walk through the permitting process, sort of a, 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 a re-engineering of it if needed. Is there any intent to do that? It sounds like, though, something's being done internally because Mr. Smith spoke of the three-day um, rule, which is, which is great. The, yeah, the internal component of it is ongoing, and I mm -hmm. think with Intergov and, and, and the like, yeah. um, that's giving them internally the opportunity to revisit. But the use of the money, yes. Um, we took the stand with the transition with the director of the place and the acting directors that we weren't going to put too much on the department right now. Um, we first looked at some aspects of the code with Ms. Schuett's contract, and that's where that money was transferred from and to. Okay. Um, I didn't personally feel, and I think Mr. Smith and uh, Mr. Uh, and Eric Lashinsky and, and others from the department were in on this meeting that it would be prudent to do both at the same time. They just didn't have the bandwidth, I, I didn't think, right. um, to do the entire study, code rewrite, and deal with all the transitions of, of personnel. Yeah, so the intent is going forward. Oh, okay. Because Ms. Hewitt was sort of morphed into um, adequate facilities. It was really, uh, yes, yeah. exactly. And we're going to discuss that a little bit later in the budget with, um, you know, where we want to go with all of that, the study of the code. But candidly, it was mm, capacity. I mean, how much can you have a, mm -hmm. a department that is... Um, so active and daily processing and mm -hmm. addressing things, and then have their an active, uh, ongoing study of the department um, while they're transitioning directors it just didn't seem to be feasible. Okay, um, I, I'm looking at page 22 in the budget book under, um, to, you know, licenses and permits, and. Uh, and as you cited, there there is there wasn't a substantial increase in uh, building the line item building, which I assume is building permits, is is um, uh, projected for fiscal year twenty three was was in a round numbers one point nine million dollars, uh, well over eight hundred thousand more than. Um, so it's it's. It's tracking upwards, uh, if you will. Um, is well, you you agree, oh, <laughs> Director Dickinson? So keep in mind, it's very difficult for us to predict yeah. that revenue source. When we look at certain revenue source, there is a trend. But in that one, we'll have up years and down years, up years, down years, depending on when the developers pull their permits. And our budget number for twenty three was likely more of an average of some past years uh, without COVID in the mix. Oh. Uh, so, it, you know, the, we don't see, I, I don't, and they, they may know better about if they're seeing a trending upwards or if it is just still like we'll get a development that permits a lot of units and then it goes back down and then back up if we get other developments, et cetera. Yeah. So the fact that it's higher than what we budgeted, our budget would have been based on more of an average of past years, not a trend. Not a trend upwards. Yeah. It would be interesting to study that as it relates to, you know, your efficiency of staff, it, it, you know, especially in this world where I, I understand you still have, you know, hybrid hybrid workforce versus on site and, and whether or not, you know, what the factors are. But I'm not going to tell you how to manage your, your staff or anything like that. Um, but again, looking at revenue, one of the most significant um, uh, 
revenue facts that we've uh, got in this budget, which is good news because typically we rely a lot you know, on property tax and when we have another source of revenue, we all jump up with joy, or maybe I do, but the hotel tax. Um, the hotel tax has seen a, uh, the biggest jump was from 22 to 23. It was a, almost an 18% increase. And then from 23 to 24, uh, we, we come down a little bit with a 6% increase. Um, so we need, to, we need to drill down on that and, and, and optimize it. Um, I understand that we have outsourced it to hotel compliance. Is that going to continue? Is that the best way to collect this hotel tax? How do we tap the unlicensed buildings? Um, are you looking into that? If I could, Alder Woman, I think Ms. Oh. Dickinson would be far <laughs> better friend. qualified to answer that than myself. I, I understand. Totally. So yes, about two years ago, we contracted with Host Compliance which is an online site that goes out and, and looks and sees who's advertising out there to rent their homes for short-term stays, and then they report back to the city and say, here's all the properties, here's the ones that you have permitted. And at that time, we outsourced, they, they took on the permitting uh, payment process, paying for the permit and, and interacting with the department on who needs a permit and uh, the, the application for the permit process was going through that site, still is today. And then they were also taking on the occupancy tax piece, which comes back to finance um, after the, um, after the uh, renters uh, pay their, their occupancy tax. So um, there's two departments involved. And we, I think we started this when Sally Nash was here and we had a combined effort going on, and we, f we feed our permit data to them, mm -hmm. and then they l load it into their portal and, and do a lot of the processing. So that's in a bit, it's helped two, tremendously two, find. Two departments being finance. Finance and, okay. and planning and zoning, because we're both using the work of the uh, Granic Granicus actually owns host compliance, mm -hmm. that Granicus site. So, uh, now we have Entergov, right? And I believe it's their intention to, at some point, have all their permitting going through one place instead of having some of the permitting on host compliance and some of it in Entergov. Uh, once we've successfully uh, are fully operational with the Entergov for the other things, we plan on moving over to the uh, moving the, the um, short-term rentals over there as well. Entergov has the capability to collect the occupancy tax too. So um, it's actually through the payment system, Tyler Payments, which is connected to our Munis product that we use, will take, can take on that collection process. We're just not there yet. So we're working together now on the host compliance site, having a couple issues here and there with it. And um, from, from my perspective, it's more like having somebody in charge. What we lack now is somebody in charge to um, monitor what host compliance is doing, sending out letters, um, you know, going, going to the owners of the property and saying, you seem to be, you, you, you're renting out here and you're not remitting, or you're not permitted and or you're not remitting your occupancy taxes. So. That's how that's managed. So that's kind of a combined effort between the two departments. It, it seems like you understand the importance of it. So thank it's, you. And, and I do think that enforcement is important, which is one of the tasks that I would like for my accounts receivable senior accountant is to be the point person for monitoring the hotel, the occupancy taxes. Um, you know, the, the people who rent only during Navy uh, graduation and the boat shows don't have to pay for a permit. They get a what they call a zero fee permit. They, um, they still have to collect an occupancy tax. And we think that that's a big piece missing out there. We yeah, have a I lot that are doing that without remitting the occupancy yeah, tax. Yeah, I don't think that's, that's known. <laughs> Seriously. Not widely. We, we've tried to get it out there, and some of the letters we initially sent on host compliance 
out to all of the properties that they identify that are doing that. But I, I don't think that it's thorough, that our yeah. process was thorough yeah. enough to, to, yeah. to find that revenue. Well, that, that's, thank you for that. that. We really do need an investment in that effort, and I'm sure that would be one of our recommendations. Um, um, the same category as far as revenue coming in, um, thanks to Alderman Gay, we have an affordable housing trust fund uh, from the hotel tax. <laughs> And it, it has uh, exponentially increased, um, well, not exponentially, but it's significant. Um, I'm looking at uh, page 18 of the budget. Is that number 141,900? Is that the money coming in from that, Director Dickinson? Or am I? You're looking at page 18 and you're talking about the housing yeah, the affordable yes. housing trust fund. That's the one that comes from. Yes, the the one. No, this is yeah, it's this is the revenue much. side. So the one forty one yeah. nine hundred is the amount that we anticipate uh, sending to this fund from occupancy taxes. However, remember the whole thing is an estimate. We estimate total occupancy taxes, right? And then three percent are going into this fund. Okay. However, that that fund is being managed by Office of Community Services with a rental assistance program. Okay. okay. So, uh, so I. Yeah. Okay. It, it is housing related, but the rental assistance needs that we're serving are being managed by Laura Gutierrez and her staff. Laura, Laura has that money, mm. and, it, and yet, and you under, and you know that Tom, right? <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't I'm learning it, older woman. <laughs> so, did you? I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> the housing trust fund funds come out of our hotel tax. Did the state simply reduce the amount of our hotel tax mm -hmm. and earmark it that reduction for the housing trust? Mm -hmm. Or is this an additional amount of money on top of what we would be getting for the percentage we would be getting for our hotel tax? So the amount that we would be collecting has always been the same. The tax rate is 7% on the rental cost of the unit. And if, and yes, the uh, representatives from the city went to the state, you have to get enabling legislation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to earmark parts of that tax flow uh, for certain purposes. Some mm -hmm. of it goes to the Anne Arundel County Arts Council, some mm -hmm. goes to the visitor center. And, and now we have 3% going to the housing trust and 3% going to AIPPC. Mm -hmm. All of that had to be enabled by the state. But we, but we are collecting all the taxes. Nothing is being collected through the state. We get the cash directly here. The, my qu I understand all of that process. So my it's not an additional amount. It's, it was one pool, and now pieces of the pool are being pulled away for these other purposes. My question is... So we now do not get to decide how that block Correct. of money is being used. Correct. Because the state, our representatives have chosen to earmark a certain percentage for the housing trust. Correct. Are you speaking so, of the money itself, the, the, the 141? Yes, the 141. Yeah, whatever the, the amount is that we get for our hotel tax, bless you. Um, now a portion of that, just as you mentioned all the other groups, uh, is earmarked specifically mm -hmm. for another use mm -hmm. that may be different from what we decided. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to be clear about that. So, That's yeah. not extra money. Right. It's money that we are getting, mm -hmm. and but the state is telling us how we have to use it. Yes, because the tax, the ability for local municipalities to tax has to come from the state giving Correct. us the authority to do so. So anytime that taxing authority is changed in any way or, or earmarked, it should be handled through state enabling legislation. Yes, and, 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 and we've been smacked about that when we tried to charge for, what was it, sidewalks some years ago, and mm -hmm. then they came back and mm -hmm. said, mm, nope, it has to you be don't have the enabling legislation to do that. Yes. So I just want us to be clear on, on that funding. It's not new money or additional money. 
it's an earmark for the money that we get. Yeah. Yes, and and I will tell you that all those pieces I told you about the earmarks mm -hmm. are now twenty six percent of our collections are earmarked for particular purposes. Okay, sorry, I got, I'm deadline on questions here, but I'm but, sorry. Um, I, no, no, no. That, um, but but to that point, then how was it? How were we able? To, we might be talking about to get. How were we able to earmark it then to the Office of Community Services? We have the right to do that. So, so when it was determined that the city had to use three percent of yep. that money for yep. rental assistance, yep. we as management had to decide where the best place within the city to manage the pot of money would yeah, go, I and that was Office of Community okay, Services. I just wanted mm -hmm. to clear that up. And then, as Jody always reminds us, at one point we had seventy percent, and now we're down to sixty-four percent, right? And Seventy-four. Seventy-four. We had. Oh, it was 80, right, sorry. We had 80. No, we had 80 percent of the hotel tax, so it's really coming out of our, it's really a loss to our general fund, but it's earmarked to good, good, good things. Um, I'm sorry, I just, two questions. Are you getting help from IT on stuff <laughs> that you spoke of? Um, you said you, you, you know, like information, putting stuff on about adequate facilities, is, are you reaching out to IT on that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mr. Paquin's staff is, is fabulous to us. Okay. And then as far as um, future costs, exposure, are you, uh, how are you doing on litigation? Well, interesting we'll that, we'll Mr. that, that Mr. Session, Lyles just but walked in, but I can certainly say we're, we're keeping um, his staff quite busy. What's that? <laughs> I said, uh, uh, interesting you asked that question just yeah. as, as Mr. Lyles walked in, but I think planning and zoning is, is keeping his staff quite busy through okay. no fault of our own, of okay. course. <laughs> but, but, but by keeping you... Just through okay. appeals and those types of things. Okay. Uh, I think I got everything. So thank you so much for um, your indulgence. Um, we are going to a break. We're going to a break. Um, we, have, we have snacks...
We're back. <laughs> um, recess is over, and we have our second and last department presentation. That would be the Office of Law. Um, we ask that you introduce yourself and your staff, uh, as we really respect the fact that you're taking time away from your day duties. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Michael Lyles. I'm the city attorney, and with me is uh, my legal assistant and uh, preparer of much of what you'll see in the, the numbers, uh, Karen Steele. Um, she'll be able to answer any specific detail questions you have. Um, our presentation is uh, um, not long, but we can walk through it for you uh, just to give you an idea of the office and our team um, and the number of employees and staff members that we have including myself is 10 um, and the, the flow of um, instruction and direction comes from the uh, the top the mayor and the city council as you see there uh, through me to, to staff who do a range of things that you're aware of um, including um, the legal work direct legal work for the city, legislation, uh, as well as um, some administrative work with uh, through the city clerk, um, documents, uh, managing uh, city council records, and uh, providing staff support to the uh, Alcohol Beverage Control Board, and uh, providing support, staff support to the city council, the city council associate. Um, litigation is probably uh, one of the things that keep us most busy. And uh, as you can see, over the last year, we have uh, been sued a couple of times. Most of the cases that are taking up uh, a lot of our uh, staff time is directed at cases that were filed in the previous fiscal year. Uh, we carry those forward. But uh, as of today, uh, we have resolved all of the cases, uh, at least in the fiscal year, without uh, claims made against the self-insurance at this time. Some of those matters are on appeal um, that we may have been unsuccessful in, but we're appealing those decisions that um, we think the court uh, courts of appeals or the Supreme Court of Maryland need to review. Uh, we did have a case dismissed. Uh, one case had no, uh, was voluntarily dismissed. One case was dismissed by the court. And uh, we had a settlement in the pharmaceuticals case where the city was a plaintiff and that resulted in um, approximately $1.8 million to us as a municipality um, with the state taking over the litigation at some point. Um, but our success rate up to this point is 100%. Um, it's too small to see, but basically Office of Law accomplishments relate to our ability to um, move municipal infractions successfully, uh, to negotiate appropriately cases that need to be negotiated, to uh, start on city code rewrite, uh, starting with planning and zoning, and to do uh, anything and everything related to the Hillman Garage partnership agreement, concession payment, um, bond placement, as well as the city dock, uh, and then all of the other kinds of uh, matters that we get into on behalf of the city council and, and the administration which relates to legal opinions which have produced some success for the city in a lot of areas. Legal transactions completed, as you can see there, many. <laughs> um, I think our biggest um, aspect for the city is providing a sound, uh, well-reasoned, and timely legal advice through written opinions. But um, we also process, review, uh, and find legally sustainable a myriad of procurements, permit documents, uh, development documents, city grants, uh, and the like, MPIA, MPIA requests, which are all fulfilled in a timely way um, in accordance with the law, uh, 38 of those uh, to date in this fiscal year. Um, you can read that. A lot of accomplishments. Uh, our office, uh, I believe, is one of the best in the state at what it does. We have uh, we hired, thanks to you, uh, a new attorney uh, who came on board this fiscal year, uh, Mr. Tripp Fulton, who uh, really gives us another uh, set of hands to, to handle a lot of the things that we've been handling uh, from litigation to transactional matters. Um, his background is one that has uh, really assisted us in providing uh, timely service and litigation, uh, legal and legislative support to um, 
the many, many of the departments that he's responsible for, planning and zoning being one. Workers' compensation, as you can see, 54% of indemnity payments made were full and final settlements uh, through um, from 4 April 22 to the present. Um, we've had uh, 12 uh, resolved workers' compensation appeals, 11 which are full and final settlements. And I think we've been really hitting our stride here with uh, really good decisions in the city's favor in many of these workers' comp cases. Um, and where we should be paying, um, the payments have been kept at a reasonable amount and relatively and rationally related to the injuries sustained. Um, the goals, this is a big issue for us because to the extent that the city um, wants the Office of Law engaged in these things, and we have heard you and we think there may be some interest in us um, doing things better or uh, more robustly or engaging into new, in new aspects, uh, we present these goals. Um, provide timely legal advice um, to our clients. Prepare legally sufficient, well-drafted, error-free um, legislation, uh, which you need as a council. Uh, complete the city code rewrite and update project. Um, successfully represent the city, of course, in, in all fora that we may appear. Uh, and prepare, maintain legal, legislative, and election records uh, and have elections and host those elections through the city clerk um, and maintain our staff support to boards and commissions, standing committees uh, as well, and provide timely public information requests. Um, and we'll do this more detail about the goals that, uh, that I just laid out, uh, our objectives, our benchmarks, our performance measures, to a large extent, for every goal, we are on time and under budget, if not under the time required. Um, we have produced um, legal advice within 24, 48 hours. Most completion is within two weeks, and that was our benchmark, and we met that goal. Uh, goal two, prepare error-free legislation. Uh, we're 100% in preparing legislation requested um, and having that be error-free and drafted within the standards of the Maryland Drafting Manual within 30 days. Many times legislation drafted um, by our staff is done in under a week. Um, much of our legislation is um, requested to be turned around pretty quickly and we're able to do that, but 30 days is the standard and we've been able to meet that at 100%. Uh, goal three, complete the city code rewrite. This requires some thought on behalf of the administration and the council, um, we have engaged in some way on looking at planning and zoning sections that have been a particular issue for the city. Uh, we've begun that process. That process, hopefully, if it continues, we're able to handle it and we'd be, able, we'd be uh, uh, most appreciative of continuing that project if the city so deems it. Goal four, of course, representing the city um, in court um, and in administrative matters, as I said, we didn't have a lot of new cases this year. Most of the cases we're involved in now uh, were uh, brought uh, in the prior fiscal year, and uh, but we're meeting those right now with 98% uh, um, prevailing or success rate in those cases. Um, and we consider the appeals uh, to be uh, currently TBD or outstanding, uh, so that doesn't really a result in a 98%, 98% is related to our uh, workers' comp compensation litigation as well as our active litigation in court where we've been successful in the cases. Um, and only one case where there may have been a, a marginal result uh, in the Packler case, there was a court decision uh, that did not necessarily look like it was in the city's favor, but we argued that this case, the writ of mandamus case, was the same of the declaratory judgment case that was just recently ruled upon was the exact same case where we won the previous year in a, writ, a mandamus case where the plaintiffs sought the city to have some responsibility over the Wells Cove pathway. And we argued that we didn't have any responsibility for it. That was a private matter. And the court in the previous judge, previous year, said we agree with the city. The same plaintiffs trying the same case in front of another judge uh, said something opposite, but still, uh, for the large part, the city is, it's not the city's issue. We've got a pathway, it's there, we're going to keep it maintained, public can walk on it, 
Um, but if anything else is required, that would be a, a matter between the, uh, the private property owner and the public or the plaintiffs in this case and having nothing to do with the city. Uh, goal five, to prepare legislation and do it timely. And we're probably about 98 percent meeting uh, that goal with respect to uh, election records and main maintaining legal and legislative documents uh, in a variety of, of forms uh, for public and historic use. And we have noted a couple of issues that we wanted to make sure that uh, we published without error. We probably had one or two um, matters that needed to have some correction after they were published, um, but we're still at about 98 percent. But we consider that goal actually met. Um, provide on time staff support and legal counsel to boards and commissions. Of, and we consider this met and number of meetings where staff and counsel were not present is currently zero, especially where we are required to to be in the meeting because there's a legal matter uh, being discussed. Many times we, we do conference with commissions, boards, um, whether or not we have to be at a particular meeting um, by request. And sometimes we agree that, you know, there's nothing legal. And so we don't have to appear. But where we are supposed to appear, where there's a legal matter, uh, we generally will have attorneys uh, in those meetings to answer questions and to deal with matters before those boards and commissions and committees. Uh, of course, we responded to PIA requests in a timely fashion. 30 day turnaround, we're usually at 10 days to 20 days to respond, even to the most complex uh, PIA requests. And long term goals um, basically to kind of eliminate the inconsistencies, lack of clarity, and grammatical errors in the city code. It's a big one for us because it becomes our Bible as we provide legal advice to the city uh, council and the administration. It's best if we have a Bible that we can refer to that is clear um, and is something that we can interpret um, without grammatical errors and inconsistencies. And there are numerous in the current code that we feel need to be corrected. But because we started with planning and zoning sections um, in the code that is in process and uh, hopefully the administration, the city council will see need to finish and performance measures. Um, if I had to say what performance measures were successfully completed, I would say all of them. Ones that were not, none. And our budget uh, is, as you see there, uh, proposed one million seven eighty three and eight hundred dollars, and we are ready to take your questions. Colleagues. <clears throat> Uh, the woman, Lacey. I'm not going to go first because Mr. Lyles, you went through this so fast. I'm just trying to catch up. I'm sorry. So please. Well, ba basically, the uh, everything that we've been asked to do, we do. Uh, all the I money, on, the money, the money that 17. we've asked, the money that we've asked for is basically unchanged from the previous year, with uh, some increases here or there for inflation. Um, but other than that, our our budget is, um, you know, what it is, what you have in front of you. Did you have any enhancements? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, so I, my next question is, were any of them not funded? But you didn't have any, so. So uh, I'll Alderman defer to you, Alderman O'Neill, and I'll come back. No, I'm still trying to absorb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, and, I would, and I would say, too, that if, if there is, we, we don't go too in-depth with some of the uh, performance issues and the legal matters, so that's very surface. Uh, if you need more, then a closed session would be uh, necessary to discuss some of the more um, detailed implications of some of the matters and where we stand. Okay. Um, who's able to speak to the self-insurance fund? Is that under Corey um, or is that under this? Um, because um, I'm trying to follow it, uh, the numbers, and they yes. kind of go up and down. And uh, I'm specifically looking at the fund balance summary, Director Dickinson. My question is any projected exposure on that? And you did say that, I guess, were you saying for fiscal year 23 or 24 that, that, that there was no impact to the self-insurance fund? Well, the self-insurance fund is, um, managed in partnership uh, with uh, 
finance and office of law and why a partnership well because uh, my office manages the substantive aspects of when to use the money yeah. and what to um and what's the best way to uh recover money spent um, finance, of course, assists with ensuring that there are sufficient funds there to um, to handle all those things that come up, and we work together in planning out what that looks like. Now, with respect to impacts, well, self insurance fund is impacted two or three ways. One, um, if we lose a case um, and the court decides that we have to pay out then damages are paid out of the self-insurance fund. This past fiscal year up until today, there have been no damages paid out. Secondly, the uh, fund uh, assists us with expenses related to litigation that we undertake to defend the city in cases. So if we're defending the city and we have to pay for a deposition or an expert, um, the self-insurance fund is used to fund that. It's called reserves. And we set the reserves when the case starts at a certain amount to cover those expenses. Um, the philosophy now is that um, we set the reserves at a level that will enable us to robustly, uh, zealously, and effectively and efficiently defend any case. We will hire who we need to hire. We will depose who we need to depose. We will serve and sue whoever we need to sue in order to defend the city from what we think are cases that have no merit. Um, additionally, workers' comp matters are resolved, uh, either settled or award, warded out based on commission awards through award decisions through the self-insurance fund as well. And our office manages the outside counsel who is paid um, out of these funds as well. So in the context of your presentation, um, you know, within the framework of your presentation, uh, my, my question would really be, are you involved in the appropriation for next year? Uh, and just I, pointing yes, to... <laughs> I don't get involved in the appropriation you of the money. You do not get involved in the appropriation. I just, I just help to manage it, make sure it doesn't get spent up. Okay. Is this something we year. should talk about now or at finance? Or uh, it go, no, I go mean, I can, I can talk a little bit about it now. As Mr. Lyle said, it is a, it is a <clears throat> combined effort with okay. Office of Law. Uh, Corey mm -hmm. from our office handles a lot of the workers' comp. Mm -hmm. issues. We also have an outside administrator, Cisco, who is keeping the claims database, all of the open claims for workers' comp and, and general liability claims, and, and uh, we even have them handling our auto now if we have an auto claim. And um, they work together because Cisco is maintaining a database. They look at the database. They help set the, set the level of reserves. Mm -hmm. And then each year we take that information and we feed it to an act. We give it to an actuary, who does an actuarial study, who says based on your past claims and how they settled out, based on um, your current claims, this is the our estimate of the liability that should be recorded in that fund for claims to date, including claims that they approximate have been incurred but not reported. And uh, and so the, the actuary comes up with it, what they think the, the allowance should be. We set the allowance in that fund at that level. Now when we go to, he, the actuary also gives us an estimate of what they think will be spent that year. And that's what you see here. Okay. Here's what they estimate will be spent uh, during this fiscal year on claims. Now actuarial estimations are not perfect so you know we have never had an overall issue with the fund but if we had to come back and ask for yeah well we're we're going over our current year uh, appropriation we would come back to the finance committee and council and ask for additional appropriations as you can see there's there's an adequate fund balance there yeah we set aside uh, a substantial amount of cash in order to to fund what the actuary says the reserve the liability should be at any date so we do that evaluation every year, and that helps decide how we set the appropriation. Plus, we add appropriations for um, 
the legal cost that Mr. Lyles was referring to, uh, some of the staff costs go to get transferred over there um, if yeah. they're working on a workers' comp claim or something that's being handled by the self-insurance yeah, fund. That's that was what I was asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, two other questions. Last year we added, um, we gave you an enhancement, which was a uh, an additional attorney. Um, can you speak to the value added um, that that provided you? Sure. Um, we added an attorney, and that attorney uh, assists us with litigation primarily, but also some transactional matters. Um, the uh, this particular staff attorney comes with uh, real estate and planning background, so he's taken on um, support to the administration in planning and zoning matters um, and before the Planning Commission, Board of Appeals. Um, so that was good where we didn't have a person able to do all of that work. Um, additionally, he has taken on uh, about 10 litigation matters. Um, and uh, you know is assisting with with those or leading those as first chair and uh, with his experience in the first couple of months we were able to uh, get one case dismissed on the list that you saw that was a case that uh, he took over from me and uh, we were able to get out of that case with a, uh, a court decision in our favor so um, we think it's been um, a great addition for us. Um, and now <clears throat> the work is evenly dispersed and not any one person has to, um, you know, kind of do evenings and weekends all the time. Um, and uh, I think it was a great thing for us. And we really appreciate the, uh, the council and the administration for allowing us to have the additional person. Speaking freely, is there anything that you're asked to do for like evening work, that kind of stuff that takes a toll on the department? I mean, well, it used to when we were down, we didn't have that extra person, oh, okay. but now everybody has one or two meetings that they will attend in the evenings or on the weekends, okay. uh, commission meetings, uh, committee meetings and things like that. It doesn't overburden any one person. So that, that work is spread out over all attorneys, including myself. And uh, we all have a couple. Um, that we attend. I attend the audit, um, you know, in the mornings and, you know, and I have a couple of evening um, commission, ABC, which meets at seven uh, at night. So nobody's overburdened and uh, we're able to manage it pretty well. And, and I think everybody's appreciative of having the additional person. So just for the public's knowledge, you have to have to attend which commissions and which committees? Well, um, HP uh, Historic Preservation, uh, Arts and Public Places, Board of Appeals, Building Board of Appeals, Planning Commission. Um, in addition, there may be standing committee meetings uh, and other kinds of financial advisory commission, which normally meets in the morning um, at 8 a.m. audit, standing committee, and then all the standing committees for the for the council, um, including work sessions, which uh, can go after, after normal work hours. My last question, and um, Jody spoke to this at her introduction of the budget. I, I, I can't find it in the budget, but you had spoken about the alcohol beverage uh, fees coming in had decreased. Um, they're, they're relatively flat and a little bit lower than, than what they have been in historical high. So. Yeah. Is there any way you can look into that um, or know about that? Um, it's, a, it's a revenue source, and just keep curious on why that is uh, flat and if there's any well because the, you haven't increased your businesses that sell alcohol the the council okay. uh, through legislation as well as ABC hasn't seen an increase in who can provide alcohol it's pretty stable yeah. uh, I don't know okay. what would drive it except that um, you know uh, the pandemic kind of hurt but businesses were still able to um, open and provide alcohol during the pandemic, which I think saved a lot of businesses. And um, but I, I think it may have also stifled the ability of others to, to get into the market. Okay. Uh, other than that, um, we probably um, we're looking at um, developments that can't get out of the ground. And so there's probably a space issue as well. Where do they go? If you wanted to open a new business that served alcohol, where is there space to do so? And I think 
that may be an issue as well that needs to be um, talked to, talked over with uh, planning and zoning. Okay, so yeah. it's a market thing. It's, it's probably a market thing. thing. It's it's nothing. I think it, it's just the the natural forces of where you put those businesses and new ones coming to the market. I think the fact that we did stay flat is a is a good thing about the city because in the state because we were able to allow folks to sell alcohol even though their business was not open right. and people could take alcohol off site and take it home uh, and you drink it or provide it with their meals if they were providing meals at the curb side. So that saved a lot of businesses. And oh, you know, absolutely. I think yeah. we, we benefited from the yeah. change in the rules there. Yeah, absolutely. During the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Are we ready? Alderwoman Finlay, thank um, you. Yeah, but on that same note, and to Ms. Dickinson, shouldn't, and, and based on what Mr. Lyle said and, and what I was thinking, we should expect our liquor licenses to be flat because we're not getting any new businesses coming in needing a liquor license. So it's gonna be flat. I mean, <coughs> there are certain categories in our budget that we know are not going to increase significantly in any given year because of the type of work. In, in this case, we're talking liquor licenses. And so we're not getting a slew of new businesses coming in that need new liquor licenses. So it's gonna be the same pretty it's much long, every year if you don't adjust the fee and i don't know how right. i haven't been here that long but in the time i've been here i don't i don't think we've adjusted the fees at all no so that's another thing that that helps keep it flat and even though costs go up 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 right their salaries go up 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 but you know the fees are flat so uh, it, uh, alderman o'neill just brought up something on in liquor inspectors it looks like the police we haven't heard from them yet they st they have they still getting that grant on inspecting restaurants, uh, uh, is that is that who's who's charged with that? <clears throat> I think it's a state grant. So the liquor inspectors are in the police department, not the fire department, right? Or well, they, in they do two different zoning. They do two different jobs. Okay. But the police actually go in and do uh, investigations around serving liquor to minors. Um, police department will ensure that the licenses are appropriate so that if, for instance, the establishment has met all the requirements to serve, the fire department will check to make sure that they're serving it and serving in the right way and that they have a license on the, on the wall. Um, if, for instance, their license has been revoked, the fire department will go and take the license and uh, ask them to hide the liquor. So they, that's a kind of enforcement um, of continuing nature as well, but the police department is more associated with the serving of alcohol in, in, Ill in an illegal manner. And where are they located physically? Are they in Gorman Street? Um, do the, do the, the inspectors? No, what um, my understanding, it's, um, it's a county grant. Right for ten thousand for alcohol and ten thousand for cigarettes, the police do it from you know, their office and they send out a uh, report. I'm not sure if it's like quarterly or random or whatever. So it looks like we're hoping that that continues because I see the money here. I was just going to confirm that with the police department because we have no one. No yeah, you have to expects. confirm what they do with them because um, they also have the job of making sure they're not. That some of that grant is geared towards making sure they're not selling it to the wrong people, right? Not yeah. and, and how much effort they get in, give to are you serving it at all without a license or mm -hmm. are you serving it to the wrong people? I don't know what effort that grant covers and and what they actually do in their inspections. Okay. So you'd have you to ask the police, police for the details on the inspection services. But you don't have any money in there for inspectors, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't deal with no, that. Right. That, that was not my question, however. Oh, that was your question about the money. I wanted to know in which department they're housed. Police. And, and the person Sorry. that does this, whoever it is, would be housed in the police department, probably out at their headquarters. Okay. For some reason, I thought they were in Gorman Street in planning. So they're in the police department. Okay. That was my question. Oh, okay. The, yeah. Thank you. Um, no, I do have some other questions. Um, Mr. Lyles, um, you're rewriting the city code. That's one of your um, goals. It's one of the administration and the council's goals, yes. Well, 
that's that was one of your goals last year and i don't think there was ever a concurrence <laughs> on the council that you would rewrite our city code rather that there would be input from the council and i do see that uh, right now you're writing the planning and zoning code and that it's going to come to the council uh, by the yes. end of this fiscal year i think is what yes. i read um, I guess my question has to do with the input from um, the elected officials as far as the code is concerned. You know, I, that's our job is to create policy. And so there's always a question about staff creating policy as opposed to the council creating policy. Agreed. So tell me your approach in rewriting the city code um, and I've spoken many times about, you know, people giving us stuff just so we can rubber stamp it um, as opposed to actually having input into the creation and development of. Right. There, there are four main aspects of the rewrite as we see it. <clears throat> um, the aspect that is where you, we really have no um, real input at this point is substantive. The first thing, three things that we're after is misspellings, organization, grammar, um, and organization includes things like three sections of the code that refer to the same thing, say different things, and they should probably all say the same thing, or a section of the code that uses a word that's not defined anywhere in the code. Mm -hmm. Let's define it, right? So we're not changing the policy. We are making the policy clearer to read through organizational restructuring. So all the words are there, but there are captions and titles and renumbering so that the public can use it in an effective way. Um, as for substantive things, um, we have hired uh, an attorney, Linda Schuett, to, to look at all of those things, including the substantive a aspects. But the substantive aspects require council approval, of course, um, administration input and it, it input from the departments. Um, all of that would get submitted um, by into the for the council's review, of course, and concurrence and then potentially a vote. Um, but the first three things are really one of the, the things that provides some of the m most headache for those that have to read and interpret the code for the public. If, if two parts of the code are inconsistent with each other, we have to make them consistent. A lot of times it's not changing the policy, it's just making sure that the words say the same thing in the same way, as opposed to different sections because they were voted on in a different year or era say the same thing with uh, with very confusing language. Uh, additionally, the code should be a, um, a list of instructions that are more mm -hmm. mandatory than permissive for especially the public and its relationship to each other and its relationship to the government. Um, using words like could, might, may, if you want to, it has no place in our code, and so we'd like to uh, suggest eliminating those. But where we see that the uh, the code is is forceful um, but unclear, uh, we have taken to at least trying to provide changes as we go through. So if the council suggests uh, or has a draft code amendment that it would like, we try to change in the grammar and correct those things before we submit it back to you. If you accept it, our form, our cleaned up the grammar, um, corrected misspellings, we try to do that throughout. So that's kind of an ongoing process and not necessarily a big one-off project. Every time we see something that needs that kind of help, we will present that to you along with your substantive bill mm -hmm. suggestion. Mm -hmm. And the council is always, um, uh, has the option to approve anything that we do and you'll see it um, in a red line. Um, our legislative uh, aid will provide background on what's changed and you'll be able to see the progression from what the code looks like to the amendment to the technical uh, alterations that were made. But you always get the chance to approve it or disapprove anything that we do. Well, thank you for that um, explanation um, because 
what it seems like is that you're doing the policy piece and you're really not. You're doing the, the grammatical piece. Yes. Coming from the English teacher, I can appreciate mm -hmm. that. And I, too, have pointed out things that were. Um, yeah, the, the policy piece will be handled correct. by the administration and the departments. Mm -hmm. And if the uh, attorney we've hired to help with that has a policy suggestion, that'll go through the normal course mm -hmm. of a sponsor and working through the legislative aspects. But what we've asked her to do is to produce all of that now and we'll put it in a form for the council to either sponsor or not or change or not but we thought that at least with planning and zoning we did have some issues um say with apf was an issue that's mm -hmm. a substantive issue that the council asked us to maybe modify or present some options and so that's the substantive piece but while she was dealing with that substantive piece, there were other inconsistencies, mm -hmm. grammatical errors, placement of things in the wrong place, lack of definitional um, definitional sections that needed to be input into the into the that part of the code. And and I I'm I guess speaking to Mr. Malinoff, I hope that when the time comes for us to be presented with these portions of the code that are being. Um, I don't want to call them rewritten because that suggests something broader in my mind, but that we also have the departments present so we can have an open dialogue about what the changes are and we can decide whether, how do we, we want to move forward. So, so thank you for that. Um, Mr. Lyles, um, the log, we had talked about there being a log in the law department so that if at any point anyone wanted to see the status of a request to the law department, whether it was legislated or um, a litigation of some sort. So is that log in existence? Well, with respect to legislation, uh, our legislative uh, aide, um, Cynthia Reuter, has developed a legislative log so you can see what request has come in, what the status of it is. She, okay. she maintains that. Well, good. And I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Reuter. I submitted two pieces of legislation last week and they both came out and so I just want to say thank you to her. Um, can't say thank you enough to our staff because um, she's awesome. <laughs> Everybody's awesome. You we know, appreciate so it. I just want to say thank you. Um, and, and we work her so you know it's not like she's <laughs> so, all right, um, but that's uh, Madam Chair, and Michael, my questions, you, I believe. Mr. Les, can you introduce her so the public knows who we're talking about? Sure. Um, the City Council Associate uh, oh. who was hired uh, this fiscal year is Kaylin Jackson. Camera on. <laughs> He's waving there. Um, Alderman O'Neill. No questions. Okay, so next we're going to have a dissertation on the word shall versus will. Anyone want? No, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, <laughs> Wow, that's it. Any more questions, Alderman Gay? Oh, okay. There you go. I have no? texting. Um, can you? I, I my, well, one is just is not a question. I was actually just shocked that people actually file um, employee compensation claims, and you all have eleven or twelve. Can you just talk briefly about that? Well, yeah. Uh, if a person gets hurt on the job. They how, will. How often are people getting hurt in an office environment? Well, we have. Well, we don't all work in office. We have police officers sure, and sure, firefighters okay. and DPW. And I would say the the vast majority of workers' compensation claims come from those three departments because of the dangerousness of the work, uh, the hazards of firefighting. Um, you know, the police officers are in getting fights with people and they break their hands or their thumbs or they twist their ankles and legs. So um, they should file a, a claim. Mm -hmm. And normally those claims um, will be paid out. There may be a dispute between us and them about how much that payment should be yeah. and how serious the injury is. Um, in rare occasions, um, we'll have a strong disagreement with whether or not a, an employee who has an injury actually had that injury here versus a prior employer. Mm -hmm. And so there may be a more litigation around those cases. But our our aim is to make sure that employees get the compensation that they deserve um, that is associated with injury that was uh, that occurred here working in the city. Are they typically expensive or no? Well, it, it's usually some percentage of their their salary. 
Oh, okay, okay. Um, and then my second question, I was just wondering also, because um, we've talked a bunch about, uh, you know, doing some sort of initiative through the Office of Law with our underserved communities and getting to some of the law schools, et cetera. Is, would it be appropriate to add an amendment or to request an enhancement so that we have the funding to do that programming? Just because I think it's important um, and particularly because you're in that role and, and Joel, et cetera, and I just think it's good for people to have exposure to that and see, you know, people like you in, in you know, running that office. Um, additionally, um, I don't really know if the office of law fits because it, it is so intense and, you know, you're constantly, um, in, in court cases, if our internship program will work with the office of law, but it would be good to see maybe if you had some enhancement or funding for like paralegal uh, programs or whatever so that residents can get the assistance because I think okay if we can't offer them a job the least we can do is offer them an opportunity to learn so that they can maybe work somewhere else and, and continue to be you know tax paying citizens here so I just is that something to think about you don't have to respond today but maybe if we could get a, a dollar amount for something like that well, well, I would just say that um, we, we'd be happy to, uh, and we have in the past, worked with interns, mostly law students, um, who come and either work for free or $20 an hour, whatever I can squeeze out of my budget um, during the summers. And that, that's been helpful as an, another pair of hands to help us with some of the, uh, the more active litigation. But uh, we're open to it, you know, but we, we don't have any... Um, opinion on us enhancements um chair license here i have a follow-up in the code re rewriting that alderman finlayson spoke of what is your interface with the planning and zoning department because they'd mentioned during their presentation that they were also working on updating the code and form based so zoning etc is that is there any sort of flow? that's the same project so they're okay so you're all together yeah, on that yeah. we, we hired uh we had a contract attorney to come in and just do that. And that, that would be Mr. Uh, Linda Shewitt. It's appropriate to mm -hmm. have to say who that yeah. is, okay. And, the, yeah. and that's in the, in the budget for, what, what are the terms of her, her, her contract, is that? Um, well, we had um, about $25,000 to pay for that work <laughs> that ended, um, that 25,000 has been e exhausted. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Miller. <laughs> we just recently transferred some additional funds there to finish the work that's been I got um, it. agreed okay. to so far. Yeah, got it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much um, for your time and efforts. For thank you, and, and thank you to my staff for all the help, Ms. Steele, as well. Thank you, Ms. Steele. Uh, and everybody else, I, I called out two people. I should call out everybody, everybody. when I do that. So, yeah. but the, the, the city, thank the you, city clerk staff, etc. Keep us in line. Take some goodies back with you. I don't have footballs. Thanks so much. You're thank welcome. You. The Teddy Grams are not real Teddy Grams. I'm just I'm saying. Sorry. Oh, They're sorry. imitation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Well, there goes. You know, if you're going to give people munchies, you. We have to Do we have we have more? Okay, from yesterday. Yes. With anybody's mic on. Madam okay. Chair, I'll move approval of the minutes for the April 18th meeting. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anything uh, else? Any other nope. business? That's no, it. no legislation at this time then. I will accept a motion to adjourn. Aye. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Wow.